Let me start by sharing a story from when I was pregnant. A friend from work, who was very protective, always came with me whenever I left our office. Whether it was to get papers, shop during our lunch break, or simply get some food, she insisted that a young woman expecting a baby should not be walking around alone. She often talked about the terrible things that could happen to pregnant women, including being kidnapped or worse. She always had a scary story about someone she knew who had been followed or nearly taken. At that time, I didn't take her warning seriously. Fast forward a few months. I was 23 and a new mom, staying at home on maternity leave. I was thrilled about my first day trip out with my little boy, who was about two, three months old. My husband was worried about me going out by myself with our son while he was at work, especially since I used to drive a sporty car, a white Mustang GT convertible. He agreed I could go, but only if I used his car for the day. He had a Ford Explorer, which we got when we were expecting our baby. I wasn't very used to driving it since I had only driven it once before, but I packed it with everything we might need. The stroller, the baby seat, a diaper bag filled with our baby's essentials, and enough baby formula for six months, just in case. I had a few errands to run, like stopping by Target, the grocery store, and grabbing something for lunch on my way back. My first stop was Target, where I enjoyed walking around, not really paying much attention to who was around me. But when I was leaving, I noticed a man. He looked average, in his late 20s to early 30s, of average height, with dark blonde hair. He wore a tight, light gray t-shirt and glasses. Something about him made me feel scared. But I told myself, there was no reason to be afraid and thought it was just the worries of a new mom. Next, I went to the grocery store. I parked in the back of the lot to avoid hitting any other cars, not being used to driving such a big vehicle. When I got out, something else seemed odd. A red Chevy was parked a bit far from the other cars, with many empty spaces around it. I had chosen to park far back on purpose, but it seemed like the Chevy had no reason to be so isolated. Again, I thought I was just being overly cautious because of my new role as a mom, and decided to ignore it. I did think it was strange that the Chevy had parked there before me. Later, I would understand it had followed me, but the driver stayed in the car the whole time I was getting my baby ready and into the stroller, which took about 10 minutes. It seemed odd the driver hadn't gone into the store yet. After more than an hour when I came back, the red Chevy was still there, with the driver sitting inside. I tried to convince myself that maybe he went into the store after me and came out right before I did but deep down I felt like he was watching me. Normal people don't worry about being watched, right? I loaded up my things and went to the McDonald's across the street to grab some food. I noticed the Chevy was following me. At McDonald's while I was ordering, the Chevy parked in a spot where the driver could see me from the lot of a bar next door. Even though this was getting scary, I tried to prove to myself that the Chevy was not really following me. So I left and drove back to the grocery store thinking that if the Chevy followed me there, it would prove he was stalking me. And he did follow. Determined to prove I was wrong, I drove around in circles, taking turns no one would take unless they were trying to see if someone was following them. I had to do this three times before I finally accepted the terrifying truth that I was being stalked. That's when I let the fear take over. I remembered what my colleague had told me about not going straight home if I felt followed. Since I live in a very isolated place, I decided to drive to the police station. But then, the worst timing, my car's low gas light came on. My husband, who never fills up the car, had left it nearly empty. I knew I couldn't make it to the police station or home without gas, and stopping for fuel was too risky with the Chevy knowing I was onto him. I had to think fast about what to do next. I thought of calling for help on my phone explaining what was happening and asking the police to meet me before my car stopped running. It seemed like a smart plan, but when I tried to grab my phone from the passenger seat, I found out the hard way that things could easily fall into the gap between the seat and the door. In a panic, I searched the seat but realized my phone had slipped into that gap, unreachable while I was driving. At this point, I was speeding down the road at 80 miles an hour with the Chevy still right behind me. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I could see the driver clearly. He wore a light gray t-shirt and those familiar nerdy glasses. It hit me then. He was the same average looking guy I saw earlier at the store. He had been following me for almost three hours. The fear became real. I wasn't overreacting. I was being chased. 
the only plan I could think of was to head to my husband's uncle and aunt's house. They lived close to where this all started, and his uncle, a tough kind of man, would be home. I figured if I could make it to their place and honk the horn, he would come out and I'd be safe. But there was a big problem. I was on the wrong side of the highway for their house, and I needed to make a turn. Waiting for a traffic light to change so I could turn felt dangerously risky. I feared even a short stop at a red light would give the man a chance to attack me. Then, I remembered another piece of advice. If you need help and can't call for it, break a law to get police attention. My plan became to make an illegal U-turn at the next light, hoping either to lose the Chevy or attract police. If a cop saw me, I could quickly explain my situation, hoping his presence would scare off my pursuer. I drove past several traffic lights, looking for a police car and a chance to make my turn. Finally, I saw an opportunity. In a moment of desperation, I eyed a narrow chance to escape amidst the heavy lunchtime traffic that sprawled across four lanes. My heart pounded with the faint hope that if I could swiftly execute a U-turn, the Chevy might be trapped by the wave of cars, giving me a precious lead. Hugging the left lane tightly, I approached the traffic light, silently pleading it would cling to green just long enough for my escape. As I neared, the light flickered to yellow. Without hesitation, I veered the truck left, stomping on the accelerator with all my might. The tires screeched a terrifying protest, threatening to overturn the vehicle, but I pressed on, driven by sheer panic. Behind me I saw the Chevy caught at the now red light, the driver furiously pounding his steering wheel, ensnared by the traffic I had hoped for. Navigating back roads near the highway felt like an endless ordeal as my fuel gauge ominously neared empty. Finally, mustering the courage to stop, I pulled into a gas station. My hands shook uncontrollably as I stepped out to retrieve my phone, while the attendant filled my tank. Fear urged me not to linger, so I waited to call the police until I was moving again, even though I sensed the Chevy had vanished. The dispatcher arranged for an officer to escort me to the station as a precaution. My memory failed to capture the Chevy's license plate or specific details, but my description of the driver and the incident locations enabled the police to secure surveillance footage from both the store and fast food outlet. I held on to a sliver of hope they would catch him. Yet a year later, having moved states away, the mystery of his identity remained unsolved. The lack of immediate danger possibly relegated my case to the low end of their priorities, despite concerns he might have been successful before or could be again. The true motive behind his pursuit remains unknown, with speculations ranging from a misguided prank to more sinister intentions like kidnapping or worse. The incident left me perpetually wary, inspecting parking lots wherever I go, haunted by the fear he might reappear to finish what he started. This harrowing experience taught me invaluable lessons, to trust my instincts and the importance of preparedness, such as keeping my gas tank at least half full to avoid vulnerable situations. These precautions have become second nature, a small price for the peace of mind they afford, ensuring I'm never caught off guard again. I was taking my dog Max for a walk, making our way across the street when the light turned green for us. Suddenly, a car sped through the red light, nearly hitting both of us. In a moment of fear and anger, I shouted, Idiot! at the driver. To my surprise, the driver hit the brakes hard, turned the car around, and drove into a parking lot just ahead of where I stood, shaken but unharmed. As I approached, I noticed the car had Illinois license plates, a long way from where I was in Ohio. The driver rolled down his window and glared at me, his eyes cold and unsettling. You should watch what you say. I don't have anyone to answer to, he warned in a tone that sent chills down my spine. I decided not to respond and kept walking, trying to put distance between us. He watched for a moment longer, then drove off, leaving me to quicken my pace home, looking over my shoulder the whole way. The next morning, I was sitting at my kitchen table, still unnerved by the previous day's encounter, when I heard a news report on the radio that made my blood run cold. A spree killer named Alex Mercer, known for his ruthless crimes in several states, was spotted using stolen credit cards at a local gas station. The description of his car matched the one that had nearly hit me and Max. I was frozen in shock. The realization hit me hard. It was definitely him. I am a 20-year-old woman, 
and about nine months ago, I was driving home from work. It was a normal day, and I was moving fast in the left lane, which is meant for passing slower cars. Suddenly, I noticed a white car, let's call it a ghost car, not moving fast enough and blocking the way. I had to drive closer to its back because it was too slow for the fast lane. Then, the driver of the ghost car started to hit his brakes hard, on purpose, several times. When we stopped at a red light, he moved to the right lane and rolled down his window. It was a warm day, so my window was down too. He looked angry and started yelling at me, claiming he was in the correct lane, which was obviously not true. After a short argument, he made a U-turn and faced me, taking pictures with his phone and shouting. When the light turned green, I quickly drove off to escape him, but he turned his car around and started following me. I drove onto two highways, speeding up to 90 miles per hour, trying to lose him but staying safe around other cars. I decided not to lead him to my house since my boyfriend wasn't home. Instead, I thought of leading him back to my workplace where I knew people could help me. The road I wanted to take was too busy, so I quickly drove through a gas station to take another route, but he kept following me. I was really annoyed and decided to lead him to my workplace to confront him, but when I got back on the main road and stopped at a red light, he didn't follow me anymore. He just stayed in another lane, still taking pictures of my car. Eventually, he stopped chasing me, maybe because I had led him too far from where he wanted to go. I hoped he would get in trouble with the police because my car was registered under a retired police officer's name. Plus, the red light he ran through at the beginning probably had cameras, so I hoped he would get caught and fined. I think he targeted me because I drive a 2012 Ford Mustang. Some people in the area seem to dislike muscle car owners for no good reason. The whole experience was frightening, turning a regular drive home into a nightmare. It's scary to think that a simple drive can become a dangerous chase because of one person's anger over something so trivial. This scary thing happened to us about three months ago, and we still talk about it because we really don't understand what was going on or what could have happened to us. It was around 7 p.m. in November, and it was already dark in a small town not too far from the city. I was the one driving and my partner was sitting next to me. We had just left a busy road and turned onto a street that was usually busy too, especially since it was close to a big shopping area. But that night, it was weirdly empty, which felt odd because of how close we were to the shops. As we were driving, we noticed a car stopped in the middle of the road, its lights on. It was really dark, but the street lamps were on, spaced out every so often. We could see the car's brake lights shining as we got closer. My partner and I were chatting, but we both stopped to ask each other if we were seeing the same thing. Stopping like that on a road where cars usually go fast felt very wrong, especially near the exit of a busy highway. So we slowed down, being careful. As we passed the stopped car, leaving it to our right, it suddenly sped up, as if trying to catch up with us. We stayed in our lane, but I had to brake again because the other driver was acting so weirdly. They started to drive really badly, moving back and forth as if they wanted to hit us on purpose. It was a clear warning sign. It didn't look like they were just a bad driver or distracted. This driver was deliberately trying to scare us, or maybe even crash into us while we were going fast. We got a really bad feeling about it. Suddenly, we were blinded by a super bright light coming from the other car, shining right through my window. My car has dark tinted windows which usually help against bright sunlight. But this light was so intense we couldn't see anything but white. I couldn't even look at my mirrors before I had to brake hard. Not sure if I could see anything in the mirrors, even if I tried. I remember my partner shouting in fear, and when we could finally see again, the other car was far ahead, speeding away. My partner called the emergency number right away. I don't like being messed with, so I pushed the gas to catch up and get the car's license number. In this part of the country, there are special lanes for turning, and I saw the car turning into one, heading towards a big shopping area's parking lot, which is built like a big circle. This circle has a lower speed limit, around 25 miles per hour, with lots of stop signs and places where roads cross each other. My partner was on the phone with the emergency operator while I tried hard to catch up to the car. This person was ignoring red lights and stop signs completely. The operator told us not to follow, but I was too determined to get their plate number, making sure to keep a safe distance and speed. I wasn't going to get too close, not knowing if they had a weapon or something, 
but it was clear the driver knew we were behind them, racing through the circle, cutting off other cars and ignoring where they were supposed to stop until we couldn't see them anymore. At that point, the police said they had officers in the area looking for the car we described and that we should leave it to them. We decided not to risk our safety or that of others just because I was upset. So we stopped following them, but still went into another shopping area across the road when we saw the car enter there. We thought we might spot them again if we looked around instead of directly chasing them. But we never saw the car again, never learned who the driver was, what they wanted, or if the police ever found them. We did see he was a man, from what we could see through his window before he blinded us. White, male, wearing a dark cap. He was driving a dark car, looked like a newer model. It was a scary moment, and I don't know what would have happened if he had managed to hit us on that empty road or if his light had made me crash. To the man who terrified us and blinded us while we were driving, I hope we never meet again. My mom was seeing my dad at that time. I was about 10 years old. Dad was staying at his parents' place because his father was not feeling well. Their house wasn't too far from ours, so we decided to pay them a visit. We had dinner there and spent some time together. Dad gave us presents. He gave me a toy cow, which I still hold dear. Everything was going fine, and it was getting late, around 11 at night. We then decided it was time to head back home. It was completely dark outside. I should also mention it was around the middle of December. There was no snow falling right then, but it was freezing, and you could hardly see anything in front of you. So, like anyone would, my mom turned on the car's bright lights. I forgot to mention earlier that she would normally turn them off when we got close to other cars, not to blind them. She was considerate, only using them when we were alone on the road. This detail is important for what happened next. As we were driving back, we ended up behind a black car. The person driving it was being very annoying, speeding up to almost 70 miles an hour, then slowing down to nearly a stop. And my mom couldn't pass him because we were on a country road with fields of cows on both sides. There was no other way to go. So we were stuck behind this car with another driver getting upset behind us. As it became harder to see again, my mom turned on her bright lights, making sure we were a good distance away from the car in front. You wouldn't do that if you were close to another car. But then, the car in front of us stops dead. A huge, muscular man jumps out and runs toward our car really fast. I start to scream and cry when I see he's holding something heavy in his hand. My mom looks scared, trying to find a way to escape. Another car was coming from the opposite direction, so she couldn't turn around. We couldn't drive past the man because his car blocked us, and the only things around were fields with fences. He bangs on our window like he's the police, yelling and cursing at us. He threatens to hurt my mom if she ever uses her bright lights again. I'm just a small, thin, ten-year-old girl, terrified that we might be hurt. I also realize that if something happens to my mom, I wouldn't know how to get back home or what to do next. I didn't know my dad's phone number by heart, and I wasn't sure how to use my mom's phone to call him. The man's actions felt wrong. Like maybe he was drunk or on something because he didn't move like a normal person. He glanced at me for a moment, which scared both me and my mom even more. My mom is also small, and our car wasn't very powerful. She felt stuck, knowing that neither fighting back nor running away seemed possible. The heavy thing the man held was actually a big flashlight, which he started hitting against the window with. He also shone the light directly into my mom's eyes, trying to blind her. It was a strange twist. My mom shouted at him to go away as he hit the window even harder, nearly breaking it. Luckily, the driver behind us honked their horn loudly, and the man ran back to his car, scared off, and drove away quickly. My mom called my dad, who spent almost the whole night driving around trying to find the man, but without any luck. I can't remember if my dad called the police or not. All I remember is crying into my pillow for the rest of the night, scared and shaken by what had happened. In my country, you often hear about scary and bad things happening everywhere, but you never think it will happen to you because you're careful and smart. You keep to yourself, and you believe everything will be okay. My mom is one of the bravest people I know. She grew up with 14 brothers and sisters, which made her very strong, and taught her to stand up for what's right without backing down. My mom is one of the oldest among her siblings, so she's always been the one to take care of others. 
She doesn't let anyone push her around, and she's always ready to stand her ground. I remember this one time when she was picking up my sister, Anna, from school, and a man tried to steal her bag. My mom saw him coming and knew he was up to no good, so she told Anna to hold on to her tightly. As soon as the man tried to grab her bag, my mom fought back hard, hitting him in the eyes and scratching him to get away. Even though she's calmer now, she's still my hero. This is the beginning of a story about a time when my mom was almost hurt really badly because of someone else's anger on the road. I was 10 years old, and it was a Sunday. I had gone to swim with my friends, and my dad was supposed to pick me up at 5. But by 7, I was so mad and worried that I decided to walk home. It wasn't far, just about 20 minutes away. As I started my walk, the sun was setting, and the streets were quieter than usual. I remember feeling a mix of anger and fear because I was alone, and it was getting dark. Little did I know my mom was out there, looking for me. She had a feeling something was wrong when my dad realized he had forgotten to pick me up. She jumped into her car, her heart racing with worry, and drove towards the swimming pool to find me. On her way, she encountered a driver who was in a very bad mood. This man was driving recklessly, weaving in and out of lanes and honking at everyone. My mom, being herself, honked back at him when he cut her off, thinking that would be the end of it. But it wasn't. The man's car suddenly stopped in front of hers, blocking the road. My heart sinks even now as I think about what happened next. The man stepped out of his car, his face twisted in rage and walked towards my mom's car. My mom, trying to avoid any trouble, locked the doors and waited, hoping he would just go away. But he didn't. He started yelling and banging on her window, demanding she get out of the car. My mom, scared but still strong, refused to open the door, trying to figure out what to do next. That's when I turned the corner, just in time to see the man pull out something shiny from his pocket. My legs felt like jelly, but I knew I had to do something. I started running towards them, shouting for help, hoping someone would hear me. The situation was about to get much worse, but I didn't know what else to do. I was scared, not just for myself, but for my mom, the strongest woman I knew, who was in danger because of a stranger's anger on a quiet street far from home. When I finally got home, my sisters were upset with me. They said it was too late for someone as young as 10 to walk home alone, and they told me Dad had just left to pick me up, but I was too angry to listen. I stormed into my parents' room, ready to yell at my mom for everything. But I found her crying instead, looking very upset. She was mad at Dad and didn't even want to talk to him. My anger cooled down, and I got really curious about what had happened. So I asked her, it turns out that at about 4.30, when Dad was supposed to get me, he was on his way back from his farm. Suddenly, some guy in another car cut him off. Dad, already upset, honked his horn and shouted some bad words out of the window on Mom's side. The guy in the other car didn't back down. He rolled down his window, pulled out a gun, and started shooting at Dad's car. Dad had to hit the brakes hard and let the shooter's car get away. After stopping the car to calm down, that's when mom noticed a bullet hole right between the front and back doors on her side. The bullet had almost hit her. They both were so shocked that when they got home, mom just broke down crying. Dad tried to calm her down. That's why they were late to pick me up. It might not sound as scary as other stories, but it's been 20 years since that day. Every now and then, I think about how close I was to losing my mom. Just a few centimeters off, and she might not have been here. And it's that thought, the what if, that scares me every single time. The fear isn't just about that day. It's the realization of how quickly everything can change. How a normal day can turn into a nightmare because of someone else's anger. This story, a reminder of what we almost lost, hangs over us. A shadow that never quite fades away. Every day I get up early, around 5 in the morning, to exercise before going to work. I usually leave my home by 5.30 because it takes me about 25, 30 minutes to drive to work, giving me a good two hours before I have to start my job. During my drive, I blast music loudly to keep myself awake, especially since it's so early and the freeway is mostly empty, with cars speeding way above the limit. My route takes me along a major highway before I switch to a smaller road for a short distance. This road has three lanes on each side, and while people drive fast here too, they usually don't go over 75 miles per hour. Despite the early hour, you see a few reckless drivers, 
but nothing too crazy. This smaller highway goes from north to south, with an entry ramp from a main street that turns into a lane, followed by two more entries from the freeway. I use this highway every morning. The entries are from both directions of the freeway. I join from the direction coming from the east, right as three other cars merge from the west. One of these cars is a bright orange sports car, and the other two are identical gray sedans. I can't recall their exact type, but they were not the kind you see often. The orange car was trapped between the two gray ones. They were speeding, easily hitting 80 miles per hour. Whenever the orange car tried to switch lanes, the gray car in front would block it, and the one behind would also switch lanes to stay behind the orange car. They zigzagged through traffic like this the whole time I was near them, not slowing down even as I took my exit. It might have just been a case of very bad driving, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the person in the orange car was trying to escape the gray ones. It could have been a severe case of road rage, or perhaps something much darker. But to those in the gray cars, I hope we never cross paths again. My name is Alex, and this scary thing happened to me in my last year of high school. I live in North Georgia, where we usually get a bit of snow every year. Our area isn't really prepared for a lot of snow, so even a little bit can mean we don't have to go to school for the day. On this day, we should have stayed home because of the snow, but the school thought the roads were okay to drive on, even though some spots were slippery with ice. We were all upset but went to school anyway. After school, I went to hang out at my buddy Mike's place. We spent the afternoon playing video games until it got dark, and then I decided it was time to head home. The roads had improved a bit, but there were still icy spots. It usually takes about 15 minutes to drive from Mike's to my house, but I planned to go slower to avoid the ice making the trip longer. Leaving Mike's neighborhood, there's this hill you can't see over until you're on it, which always makes me nervous. If a car came over that hill too fast, they could crash into the back of me. The road is usually quiet, so I've never had problems before. But this time, just as I pulled out, a car came flying over the hill. They had to hit their brakes hard to avoid hitting me. I know they were going too fast, but I still felt guilty. They honked loudly, clearly mad, and I gave them a sorry wave and continued on, with them right behind me. Ten minutes later, they were still tailing me closely, shining their bright headlights, making it tough for me to see. I was getting really worried because they seemed very mad, and it hit me that they were actually following me. I didn't want them to know where I lived, so I started making random turns to shake them off, but they kept up with me the entire time. So I pushed the gas harder hoping to create enough space between us so I could sneak away on a road they wouldn't notice. But looking back, that was a bad choice. I should have driven straight to the police, but in the moment, I thought I had a better plan. Driving way too fast, I spotted a side road and started to slow down a bit, not wanting to take the turn at full speed. But as I was turning, my car hit a slick spot of black ice and skidded off the road, ending up in a shallow ditch. Oh no. I was scared to push the gas too hard thinking my car might flip over. So I just sat there, shocked, until I saw in my rearview mirror the car that had been following me. It was now stopped, and both the driver's and passenger's doors were wide open. Before I could react, my own car door was yanked open. A man leaned in, unfastened my seatbelt, and dragged me out onto the road. I immediately wished I had locked my doors, as the man and another person started to beat me up. I curled into a ball, yelling for them to stop but they just swore at me and kept kicking until they decided they were done. Then they got back into their car and left. I was left there, completely shaken, and managed to crawl back into my car to call my mom. She told me to call the cops and said she was on her way to get me. The police came, but I couldn't give them much to go on. Just that two guys in a sedan had followed me and attacked me. It was too dark to see the car well or what they looked like, so the police never caught them. If only I had driven to the police station instead of trying to shake them off by myself, I might have avoided all that pain. Last year something scary happened to me and my friend Mike. We were driving back to our town after spending the day in a neighboring state. It was late, and the roads were mostly empty. Suddenly a woman driving a car started to flash her headlights at us, signaling Mike to drive faster. Mike was already driving at the speed limit, and it was very dark making it hard to see the road ahead. For a while, the woman kept flashing her lights. Then she drove up next to us. 
She could have passed us at any time, but instead, she chose to yell at us. Her screams were so loud we could hear her even with our windows up. Where we live, people have been hurt over road rage incidents, so Mike reached for her phone, thinking we might need to call for help. As she did, our car accidentally swerved a bit towards the woman's car. Mike quickly corrected the steering, but the woman screamed even louder and started to follow us very closely. As we approached the first exit to our town, I told Mike to take it, hoping to get away from this aggressive driver. But the woman followed us off the highway. In a desperate attempt to lose her, we turned into a parking lot. She followed, but was stopped by a red light, giving us a chance to escape back onto the highway. However, she caught up to us again. This time, we were lucky. A truck pulled onto the road, blocking her view of us for a moment. We took advantage of the situation, made a right turn at the next light, and quickly wove through the traffic to put as much distance between us and her as possible. We managed to lose her after she had been chasing us for about 11 miles. It was a terrifying experience, and it made us realize how dangerous the roads can be, not just because of accidents, but because of the people on them. Last night, I was driving in the middle lane of a busy city road when suddenly, a car from my right nearly crashed into me. I glanced over and saw it moving wildly, stopping quickly then going again. I honked the horn, trying to catch the driver's attention, wondering if they weren't paying attention. When I looked closer, I saw the driver drinking from a dark bottle. Then the driver got really close to my car, yelling loudly. I wanted to avoid any trouble, so I changed lanes to the far left to get away, but I could still hear him yelling. I turned on my back camera and saw him zigzagging through traffic to follow me. He sped up, looking like he wanted to hit my car from behind. When he was almost touching my car, I drove through a red light I was stopped at, turning right, hoping he would stop following me. Checking the back camera again, I saw he was still behind me trying to hit my car. I got really scared and took a side street but he was still behind me, trying to keep up. I saw a highway entrance ahead and sped up, hoping I could lose him there. The entrance had two lanes joining into one. I passed another car thinking it would slow him down. But when I looked back, I saw he was driving off the road, through the bushes, just to get ahead of the other car and catch up to me. I was driving very fast, almost 100 miles an hour, terrified. I slowed down a bit and called 911. I quickly told the operator what was happening, and she told me to try to get to a safe place. The man caught up with me again on the highway, trying to hit my car on purpose. I slowed down, hoping he would just go past, but he slowed down too. Then his wife in the passenger seat threw a bottle at my car. Suddenly my car was covered in a sticky, dark liquid, and I couldn't see well. I thought maybe this was the end of his anger, and I saw him drive away on the highway. I took the next exit, thinking I couldn't just ignore what happened. As I tried to escape, the man saw me and changed across four lanes to try and hit my car again at the freeway exit. I had no choice but to speed through the city streets. Eventually, I was stuck at a red light right next to him. I looked at him and rolled down my window, and he was yelling at me. Why did you honk at me? Do you think I'm a bad dad in front of my kids? You want to fight? His wife was also shouting at me, asking why I would honk at them while their kids were in the car. I saw two kids in car seats in the back. The dispatcher, still on the phone and hearing everything, told me to try and get away. I had enough. I just wanted to escape, so I made a U-turn to get back on the freeway. He followed me, nearly crashing into a plastic barrier to do so. He was behind me again, trying to hit my car as I tried to get onto the freeway overpass. I saw him by my side, holding something up. Then a loud bang. The dispatcher yelled, Did he shoot at you? Are you okay? Thinking I was shot, I started screaming. He's shooting at me! He's going to kill me! Kill! The dispatcher said escaping wasn't working. I sped up, and thankfully there was no broken glass or injury to me. The dispatcher advised me to pull over to a safe place, so I drove to a nearby mall's parking lot and gave the dispatcher the car's make, color, model, and part of the license plate. All the while, I worried he might be following me again, but they quickly sent an officer to meet me. Waiting for the officer, I remembered my car's cameras constantly record, so I saved the footage. When the officer arrived, I shared my story in detail and mentioned the footage. We checked my car, which was mostly undamaged. The officer told me that since I wasn't hurt and my car was okay, there wasn't much they could do. 
I asked him if this wasn't an attack, and he said because the bottle hit my car and not me. It doesn't count as an attack. I wondered if it was dangerous driving, but he told me here in this place, that's a small crime, and you need a special police officer to judge that. Then I asked if trying to crash into me could be seen as trying to kill me. But he said it was just angry driving and not much could be done. The most he said was if they got the full car number, a police could visit and talk to him. I asked if the video could help get the man in trouble, and he told me to send only the important parts and pictures, though he doubted anything would happen. After all this, I was very upset. I went home and looked at the video from my car. It had everything. The near crash, his wife throwing a bottle, his angry face and words, his car number, and him trying to hit my car. All caught on camera. Days later the police called, matching the car number from my video with their records. A week and a half passed with no news. I know laws are laws, but I can't accept that such dangerous behavior on the road goes unpunished. It scared me a lot, risking my life, his kids' lives, and everyone else driving near us. This has left me feeling let down by the system. Despite the danger, it seems he won't face consequences because of legal loopholes. I'm trying to stick to the facts, but this experience was truly scary. Even now, I'm nervous about driving too close to others, changing lanes, or using the horn. This incident has really affected me. Plus, the man took photos of my car before the loud noise. Why? Has anyone else faced something like this? Is there really no action to take? Any advice on how to ensure those kids are okay? I have the video and everything.